So, welcome. This is my voice. As you can probably tell, I've decided that I'm going to start to narrate my videos. I've been getting more and more questions lately about the products that I use, as well as the techniques that I use to do the scrolls. And it's going to be easier to explain it via narration, with the video playing right in front of me right now, than to write it down after the fact. So hopefully this doesn't turn anybody away from my videos, because this is how I think I might do my uploads from now on. From the title of this video, you could see that this is a scroll or manuscript based off the Walters Manuscript W211, full, also known as page 203R, or the right side of the 203rd page. I have decided to split this video into two parts because a 16 minute video is a bit long for the attention span of some, and if I were to try and speed up the process even faster than what it is now, it'd be far too fast. Even now, I'm pushing it for speed. Right now, I'm doing the sketching for hand. I start with a pencil, and then I go over it with a sepia micron pen, rather than tracing it with a light box, which is my preferred method. I just don't have an ac access to a printer right now, because I'm in the process of moving. So I can't print off the original copy to trace on my light box. A lot of people would say that tracing is cheating. I personally don't think so because I never fully replicate what I trace. I only ever do it on medieval texts and I don't do it on modern pieces. I just use it to get the shapes and designs that are traditionally medieval and less used in current art. It allows me to make far more authentic pieces for people that I will be giving them to. And it also allows me to practice shapes so that one day when I am better practiced, I'll be able to come up with completely original designs that follow the same rules as the medieval works. So it'll look like it fits into that time period, even though it's not. For my paints, I use watercolors from a Koei Noor palette. If I can find a uh, link for it. I'll put it in the description below, but I'm honestly not sure where I got this palette. I think it was a gift. I don't use them like traditional watercolors in the scrolls that I replicate or produce. I only use them because acrylics or oils would crack when the paper is moved and if you put too thick of a coat on top of them. I could also use gouache paint, but when I started doing these, all I had access to was watercolor. So I'm far more comfortable with them than anything else. One of the techniques that I use that isn't really apparent in the videos is that I have to wait between each layer of paint so that it properly dries. This is because in medieval scrolls there was almost no shading done or blending of the colors, at least in the earlier manuscripts that I choose to replicate. The quote unquote shading that was done was typically multiple shades of the same color layered upon one another so they didn't blend, but they appeared to give the piece a bit of dimension. I'm doing that here with the light blue on the D. Yes, that is a D that I am illuminating, even though it doesn't look much like one. I'm only doing three shades of each color also, because it just makes it a little bit easier and less time consuming. Although it looks like I'm putting down white at the moment, it is really still a blue mixed down on top of a white. A lot of watercolors say that you shouldn't need to use white in your paintings and the paper should be the only white that you use, but where am I layering on top of solid colors and not using traditional watercolor techniques, I choose to ignore that vice. Instead of using a lighter green, I tried to use yellow on top of the green leaves as one of the shade layers, but it didn't really turn out. It looked really muddy and faded into the green leaves, so I changed that midway through and used a white mixed with yellow to make it more creamy rather than sharp. The vines show the shading process the best because I go over them with a brown, a lighter brown, and then a white all in succession in the video. The lighter brown that I put down doesn't appear very well in the video, but in person it looks a lot better. And once the white goes down, you could see the highlighting that gets done a lot better. The next part of the video is one of my favorite steps, and it is the painting of the gold. I plan someday to learn how to use gold leaf, but for the time being I am using what is known as shell gold. It is not a store-bought paint, but rather a handmade paint that I have gotten from a friend that is primarily made of arabic gum and mica powder. I don't know the exact recipe, but that's what my friend's job is for. 
It would have been used in medieval times as an alternative and cheaper form of gold when one wanted to appear to have enough money for gold leaf. The difference between the two is that with gold leaf, I would have had to put down that first and illuminate the rest after the fact. Because if I tried to do what I'm doing now and put the gold on after the illumination process, the gold leaf would not only just stick to the glue that's put down, but also the paint that is put down. I currently find that shell gold is a very forgiving paint to use rather than gold leaf, because if I make a mistake with the gold, I can paint over it, something that's not as easy to do with gold leaf. I can also get a lot more detail than what I think I could do at this time with my skill level with the gold paint rather than with gold leaf. The mica powder in the shell gold that I use gives it a very shiny and iridescent appearance, which you will see at the end of the video. It is very easy to use and only requires water to activate, like a watercolor or a gouache. It can cause a little bit of trouble when you don't place enough down initially and you end up with spotting, and it can also create some lumps and bumps on the page where you have painted down the undissolved mica powder, so you have to make sure to mix it well. One of the things you might notice is that I have a scrap piece of paper under my hand and over top of the art. I do this because if I didn't, the oils in my hand would seep into the page, and when I try to paint on top of them, or do calligraphy over top of them, the ink wouldn't seep into the paper properly, and it would make a very spotty and chipped effect, which isn't what I'm going for. So basically, the rest of this video is just me painting the details onto the flowers around the border, and painting the gold around the border. I wanted to show all of that detail work in a little bit more close up, but my camera decided for that footage that it was going to zoom in and out consistently and I didn't notice as I was painting it, so I had to scrap the footage. This is the final gold that I'm putting around the border. You can also see bits of my hair because I'm leaning a bit too far into the frame of camera. So getting near to the end of this video now and it's going to come to the part where I show you the glittery effect the shell gold gives the painting. I'm just finishing the painting process for this part, so there's really not much more I can say about it, except it looks cool in a time lapse. Overall, for this half the piece, it took me around four hours to do, not including the wait time between each layer. I will continue with the rest of this illumination process and calligraphy in the next video, so thank you all for watching. I hope you learned something, and I will see you all in the next video.